I was asked to come and speak on the topic, understanding spiritual warfare. What I will do is that I will be flying, you know, like a jumbo jet, high up. Uh, because in the month, these things will be brought down so that we can understand. If you have a pen, please keep it ready. You will need to take quite a number of scriptures that you can go and refer to at home. But I will still try to come down in some areas so that we can understand and that the Lord can minister to us. Amen. Let me start by telling you a story of a nine-year-old boy, Joey, who was asked by his mother what he had learned after being in Sunday school. And this was his reply. Well, mom, our teacher told us how God sent Moses behind the enemy lines on a rescue mission and led the Israelites out of Egypt. When he got to the Red Sea, he had his army build a pontoon bridge and all the people walked across and were safe. Then he radioed the headquarters for reinforcement. The bombers came and blew the bridge and all the Israelites were safe on the other side. The mother turned to Joey and said, Joey, is that really what your teachers taught you? And Joey said to the mother, Mom, if I tell you what they actually taught us, you will not believe it. You see, there are many of us that invent truth because we find it difficult to take what is in Scripture. Today, I want us to be guided by the revelation of the Scriptures, not by what we have heard. I know this is a topic that has been taught variously in different places, and some people who have taught it leave you wondering, is that what the Scriptures actually teach? So today I will try to be true to the scriptures and I want you to judge me using the same scriptures. And if it is true, then let us uh, follow what God is telling us. When we talk of spiritual warfare, just the word warfare, it means engagement or activities involved in war or conflict. Activities involved in war or conflict. That is just warfare. So when we say spiritual warfare, I want to say it is not what has been ongoing as a blame game of the devil, of the devil for everything that goes wrong in our world. But rather, this is my definition. And I want you to understand my definition because you will understand everything else that I will be saying. It is our opposition to Satan in all his efforts to promote evil. And we know the devil comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. So in all his efforts to steal, to kill, and destroy, but also he is here to fight good. So it's our position against the devil in, in his promotion of evil, in his idea of fighting what is good, and in trying to stop God's plan. The devil is here to try and frustrate what God intends. And when we read the Bible, my persuasion is this, that spiritual warfare or the battle against the powers of darkness is older than man. The hostilities started when Satan in pride wanted to be like God. And the Bible celebrates that there will come a moment when the devil will actually be defeated. The battle began or the conflict began when the devil in pride wanted to become like God. If you want to see where I have got that, uh, got that idea, you need to read Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 to 15. And you can also read Ezekiel 28 verse 12 to 19. Verse 12 to 19. Having said that, I want us now to read the scripture that will guide us. So that you don't say that bishop of ours, deputy bishop of ours, as saw Miss uh, Biblia. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. It is 24 verses. And that's what I will read. I am going to use a very simple version 
called the New Living Translation, NLT. Very quickly, the serpent was shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees of, in the garden? Of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It is only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Notice the devil here is trying to get the person in the same problem. You know, he, he wanted to be like God, and he is saying, you'll be like God. But let's continue. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some, of, some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they shewed fig trees, fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breeze were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord asked, Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me. Blame game here. Uh, she replied, that's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cast from, uh, you are cast more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, uh, uh, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cast because of you, the ground, not the man. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and, thris and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain. By the sweat of your brow, will you, will you, will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made? For you were made from the dust and to dust you will return. Uh, then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve, because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing for, from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out Take fruit from the tree of life and eat it. Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. Uh, after sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. A long reading, but it's important for us to do that. How did the human beings get and join to the battle? At creation, God had a perfect fellowship with man. 
But Satan was already in existence, had a long experience, and was opposed to the entire work of God, including the creation and the advancement of man. And he decided that he wanted to disrupt this, disrupt this fellowship. This resorted in the fall of man. And we have read about that in the passage. And because of man's choice, he was enjoined to the spiritual warfare, the fight against the powers of evil. The attack on man was an attempt to frustrate the plan of God. But God effectively and continually is countering this. Herein lies our hope. <coughs> I want now to, me to mention how Adam and Eve had lost the battle. How did they lose the battle? Because this will also help us to know how we can lose the battle. First, they did not refer, <clears throat> they did not refer back to God. Secondly, they failed to obey. And thirdly, they did not trust the word of God. They failed to refer back to God. Whenever you choose to go at your own without involving God, you are a candidate for failure and for defeat with the powers of darkness. Secondly, when you choose not to trust the word of God, you trust the words of men, you are also exposing yourself to the devil. When you choose to disobey what God has said, then you are also going to be in trouble. And I want you to note those three things because they will be important in answering some of the questions that later we will be looking at. This leads me to say, thank you, just open it for me. Communion with God and believe in his word and obedience are the most critical weapons in spiritual warfare. Without these three things, Communion with God, talking to God, prayer, yes. And I'm talking about knowing the word of God and believing it and obeying it. Then you are just, as it were, beating water on a pestle, with a pestle and a mortar, as we say in my mother tongue. Prayer without a clear walk with God is powerless. Very much like the prayers of the prophets of Baal in comparison to the prayer of Elijah. James chapter 5 verse 16 is very clear. It tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person is the one that avails much. It is not just any prayer, but it is of a righteous person, a righteous man. And I want you to underline the word righteous. This is what made the heroes in the past to stand out. For example, we are told that Queen Mary of Scotland used to say that I fear the prayers of John Knox. John Knox was a preacher in those days when the queen was ruling than all the armies of England. I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies of England. John Knox was a Christian, a righteous Christian, and because of his righteous walk with God, his prayers were powerful. And I want to say, if we become righteous in the presence of God, our prayers will make a difference. Our prayers will be able to achieve what we are not able to achieve on our own. Brothers and sisters, I want you to note from the passage we have read where the battlefront is. Adam and Eve had seen this tree before, I believe that for many days they had walked in that garden, but they had seen the tree and had been obeying God. But when Satan came with his temptation, he came with deceptive words, he made suggestion. He made a suggestion, and the devil always comes with a suggestion. He comes to speak to our minds, and he tells us that this is a good thing. There is also now the sense of sight that was involved. They looked, the woman looked at the, at the fruit and said it was beautiful. And there was reasoning in the mind. There was a sense of taste when she tasted. It must have tasted well. And then the will followed. 
the will made the decision to actually eat and to give it to her husband. The power of suggestion. I'm talking of spiritual warfare that it is centered in your mind. You walk every day with the possibility of spiritual warfare. And I want us to be disabused of the thinking that spiritual warfare is when we come and we bind the devil and then we go away and we say we have done spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is not an event. It is not a project. It is a lifestyle. You are in it 24-7, day and night as per the scriptures, because the devil will tempt you at any time. Maybe I'm running ahead of myself. What I am saying, that the center of the battle is your mind. You need to guard it, because your mind is where you receive ideas. That's where values are developed and processed. That's where you are influenced in your talk. That's where you are influenced in your actions. That's where you are influenced even in how you are going to live. So guard your mind. We could have read from the book of Ephesians, but we, we didn't go there because it brings this very clearly. But I know because this is a, a month-long uh, series, these things will be brought out. I want you to notice that Satan's onslaught had impact in our spiritual, our physical, our economic, and social well-being. The relationship between us and God was affected. When the devil is fighting us, he is targeting our relationship with God. And in this passage, the very first battle, the very beginning of spiritual warfare for man, there is that that is affected. We also see that man was affected in his relationship with his wife. So I'm talking about social. There was blame game. It is the wife that you gave me. It is the serpent that you put here. They were not taking responsibility. Please notice also, there is shame. The first thing that came up is that they felt shame. Their eyes were opened and they were ashamed. And these are the results, some of the results that come. And then they have to hide away from God. There is hypocrisy. There is the wearing of a mask, which was not necessary before this. But because of it, this is the result. God also instituted pain in childbearing. And more than that, they were banished from the presence of God. And I want to say when the devil fights you and defeats you, these things happen. Shame will come. Relationships will be affected. You will find that you are also away from the presence of God. No wonder that when people have gone through trouble, the first thing they try to think of is where is God? He has left me. I am also going to leave him. I am also going to disengage. Brothers and sisters, when we do not win the battle, that the devil throws at us, we will find that these things are happening. The shield against the human suffering seems to have been removed. Hostility between man and animals was instituted because God said there will be an enmity between you and the serpent and all other animals. The ground was cast. The reason why we have unproductive ground was because of what man had done. It was cast for the sake of man. But I want to say, it is not man that was cast. And consequently, work is not a curse, but a solution to the curse on the ground. And when we engage in work, we are doing the will of God, and God honors it and blesses it. All hardworking people, whether in family setting or whether in nations, will prosper as per God's instruction. Do not think that we are cast. We are not cast. The ground is the one that was cast. Consequently, spiritual warfare is about real issues. It is not, you know, when I was going through the university, we would go for a kesha or something like that, and you would hear people saying, Shetani nimekushika kwa mkia, nimekuzungusha, nimekuzungusha, nimekutuka mbali. Those are just gymnastics. Yes, 
the truth of the matter, you will do that and thereafter you will go and do vitukos because that's not where the battle is. In fact, I think that is part of the devil trying to keep you away from the truth. The devil wants you not to believe he exists or he wants you to think that he exists and he is in control of everything. I want to say that spiritual warfare targets families. Spiritual warfare targets the individuals. Spiritual warfare is about communities and nations. And your responsibility as an individual is to keep your battlefront safe. Keep your battlefront safe. Because demonic influences come to persons through pressure, through suggestions, through temptations in differing degrees of severity and variety of forms. The devil will come in different ways. And I want to say this. The devil also is strategic. He is not a fool. He tends to target the heads. Let me explain it. The devil will target the head of the family. I'm not saying he will not target the others like the children. But he knows that if I can get the head, then I have got all the other people. The, the devil will target the head of an institution. The devil will target your senior pastor more than anybody else. The battles will be on him because if he can manage to get him, it will affect many more people. Not that I'm not saying because he targets the heads. I'm saying because of the truth that we are getting. The devil will target the heads of the ministries. And I'm talking about in our governments. He will target our president. And that's why we must pray for him and cover him. Because he knows, the devil knows that if I can get the president, I can cause suffering for many people. But if we are protecting our president, we will be protecting ourselves. And as if we were. I also want to say that the higher you go, the greater the battles. As an individual, when I was just a pastor, I think the demons that used to fight with me were of a lower rank. When I moved to be a senior pastor, the, the demons that were assigned towards me were at a higher rank. By the time I go to the place of the deputy bishop, I am fighting with bigger demons. And I'm speaking from experience. And I imagine that my presiding bishop, I pray for him. Because I know the demons that go for him are not weak ones. Brothers and sisters, spiritual warfare is something we will encounter on a daily basis. In the Old Testament, consider the story of Job. It's an important one that brings out critical points for spiritual warfare. Unlike Adam, his suffering is not because of moral failure, but rather, as a righteous person, he suffers. And you know, the Bible tells us in John 16, 33, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. So spiritual warfare is not necessarily for sinners, and I will be coming to sinners, and I will be saying that they are in a worse place. Spiritual warfare is actually for that person that is making spiritual progress because the devil wants to stop you in your tracks. He wants to hinder you. He doesn't want you to make advancement. And we find that coming out from the story of Job. But we also notice that he had to ask for permission to go and fight Job. You ask, is that unique to Job? No. If you read in the book of Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, Jesus talking to Peter says, uh, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan has asked. So even us, and who is Peter? Peter is the designate leader of the church when Jesus leaves. And I want to say this, the devil knows what God's plan or some of God's ideas as to who he wants to promote. And the devil can target somebody who God has earmarked for, for high positions. You may be even a child. 
Listen to me keenly here. That's why we need to pray even for our children. You know, God does not decide after a long time that you will be promoted, you'll become this. He already creates you with a purpose and he knows it. And even as a child, God knows. And I think sometimes the devil knows. And he will target that child from an early age to start fighting when you have a destiny. I am sure some of you will remember or will know or have heard some people who have said that your star is stolen. I don't believe too much on that stuff. But there is an element of truth that when God has ordained that you will go to prominence, then the devil also targets you from an early age because he wants to frustrate at that early age. When Jesus was born, the devil made plans to destroy him through Herod. I am speaking what we have precedence of. He started killing children. Herod killed children inspired of the devil, but the target was Jesus, not the other children. And I want to say, that's why we must pray. We don't know what our children are earmarked for, but we must pray for them and cover them on a continuous basis because the devil targets them. But we see that he has to get permission. However, we know that Jesus has said, in this world, we will have trouble. But I want to say, Satan had to ask for this permission, but thank God, we have the Holy Spirit, and he helps us in our prayers so that we are not victims, but, uh, but victors. Because of the Spirit, we have the ability to pray and break through. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27 tells us that the Holy Spirit helps us to make intercession according to the will of God. And the truth be said, we don't always know the will of God. I don't know what is the will of God next year for me. But when I pray in the spirit, I could be praying about next year. And I want to encourage anybody who is here who has never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that you'll be helped in your intercession and you can be making a headway even concerning the future. Wow, this time is going so fast. The righteous have a hedge of protection around them. That's why the devil has to seek. In fact, the devil himself testified in the story of Job, chapter 1, verse 9. He went and said to God, ah, you have built a hedge around him. There is a hedge of protection. Brothers and sisters, we should not walk with our heads down. We are protected by God on a continuous basis. And the devil knows that. By trusting Jesus, you have already done a lot of spiritual warfare. By being saved, you have already done a lot of spiritual warfare. Why? Because you are, you are giving yourself to God and he surrounds you, he protects you, he builds that hedge. Hallelujah. Spiritual warfare is there for not an event. I have already said that. And we do disservice to the people of God when we present it that way. The only people that are not protected are those who have denied God, rejected him. Romans chapter 1, uh, if you read from uh, verse 24, 26, 28, there is a theme that is recurring. God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them up to their desires and, and that. And that means that they bear the fruit of judgment. Why? Because of not being given to God. I want to say, having said that, that we are protected and there is a hedge of protection around us, that divine restraint is removed when we break the moral law or the moral code of God. So this is important in answering the question, can a believer, can a Christian be demon-possessed? On one hand, I say no. But I must quickly say that Ecclesiastes 10 verse 8 says that when a person breaks the hedge or breaks the wall, a snake will bite him. Consequently, if you are a Christian, and you decide to break the wall, the hedge of protection that God has built around you, 
then you may be inviting the devil. You are opening the door and depending the extent to which you open or you break that wall, the more the oppression that the devil will bring. Demons will enslave, demons will oppress a man to the degree that he or she is willing to violate God's moral code. How do we open the door? I will tell you a few things. Sexual immorality is one of those things that exposes people to demons. And I have seen believers who have fallen into sexual immorality being oppressed by the devil or even becoming demonized. demonized. Not that the devil owns them. That demons can come. And I, I have witnessed demons being cast on people who are Christians because they went that route. I see also the sin of idolatry. And idolatry includes those people who go in witchcraft. Those who dab in things to do with uh, the worship of the, of the devil or doing things. And sometimes innocently. Games like Oija board and things like that. It is possible. You may go into that and the demons don't come. But by opening that door, I have seen people getting involved or rather being demon, demonized. I'm calling it demonized. A demon getting into your life and starting to, you know, to move you away from the things of God. But because you opened, just like you have to invite Jesus, you can also open the door. And you see, Jesus is a gentleman. He waits to be invited. The devil is not a gentleman. He sees an open door, he just comes marching in. And how do you open that door? I have said sexual immorality. I've talked of idolatry, witchcraft. I have, I have seen people who have opened doors through drugs, abuse of drugs, hard drugs. I'm not talking about medicine, but I'm talking about hard drugs. People who commit murder. And I want to mention here abortion. I could give you a testimony of a, of a lady that I was praying for. She was brought, she was having nightmares, and in the middle of prayer, God dropped a word in my heart, and I stopped praying, and I just asked the lady, have you committed abortion? And she said, yes. I told her, can you please confess that sin? As soon as she confessed that sin and repented of it and gave her life to the Lord, she was set free. Is it possible that the devil has found an entry into your life because you have exposed yourself to this? You check. The other questions here that we ask, ancestral curses. Can a Christian be affected by curses? I want to say that blessings and curses are God's prerogative. It is God who decides to bless. Now, in the book of Proverbs 26 verse 2, Proverbs, I think I'll read that one so that it, it gets into us. Proverbs 26, verse 2. It says, like a flattering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse will not land on its intended victims. My interpretation of that verse is this. That nobody can curse you when you are not deserving of a curse. God will not allow a curse to rest on you. And I want to say this, parents sometimes can get annoyed. For example, there are those who will curse their children because they have become saved. And they are not saved. And maybe you have stopped buying beer for them. You have refused. And so I curse you, my son. Don't fear. If it is because of righteousness, that is undeserved curse. It will not land. And we should not be believing in fear. We should not be intimidated to do what is ungodly because somebody has threatened that I am going to curse you. And dare I say, there are even pastors who threaten their members. If you don't bring your tithe, I'm going to curse you. <laughs> It will not land when there is no reason for it to. But curses are there. And God, you just need to read the book of Deuteronomy. There is a place of blessings, there is a place of curses. But it is God who, who allows that to happen. 
And I'm saying, for me as a Christian, I will not be walking in fear. I will be walking in boldness and courage and believing that it is well as long as I'm walking in with God. When I fail, I repent and ask God to forgive me. And when I am forgiven, no curse is going to land. Hallelujah. If you are cursed before you became a Christian, make your life right with God. Repent of whatever was wrong and the Lord will break those curses. Hallelujah. We find that uh, Reuben had been cursed by his own father when he was speaking uh, in, the, as, uh, in his birth, deathbed. You know, Reuben, if you read what was spoken to him, it's more of a curse because he had, he had sinned. He had slept with his father's wife. But much, much later, read what Moses wrote. It is like that curse was lifted because he had started walking right. And brothers and sisters, just walk right with God and nobody can curse you. And uh, that to me is the same with bewitching, somebody bewitching you. Even Balaam testified, I have tried witchcraft on people of God, it couldn't happen. Numbers 23, 23. He said there is, no, there is no witchcraft that can work against the people of God. It was the Israelites then, but it is you today. You are a child of God. No witchcraft will work against you when you are walking right with God. Hallelujah. Allow me to run through the, the rest of the points. However, in the case of Job, we know that God allowed Satan to tempt him. Uh, um, but this was actually, the devil was saying, Job follows you with an interested love. He loves you because of what you have done. And God was saying, no, 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 no. The love of Job is pure. And it was a contestation between that. And the devil was defeated at the end. Satan was wrong of the assessment that he had of Job. And he was proven wrong. My question is, should there be a discussion about you in heaven, would you be like Job? That you love God with an interested love. What I mean, it is not because of what you get from God, but you love God for who he is. Or are you otherwise? Job overcame by having unshakable faith in God, Persistent trust and confidence in God. Maybe I'm repeating myself. At the end, he actually said that, you know, I knew about you, but now I have seen you, I know you. And when God has tried me, he had spoken later in chapter 19 that God will bring me out. And I know my Redeemer lives. I will not be able to expound that. But just to say he trusted God. He held on to God. Are you such a Christian holding on to God? Then do not fear the devil. I could go on to Jesus, the son of God, the devil. Anaibu. The devil, Anaibu. And he is no respecter of persons. He comes to test Jesus. And you know that thrice he tried to Jesus, I mean, he tried to bring Jesus down. Let me summarize for you what what he did, he's, hey, hey. he comes at a time of prayer and fasting. Brothers and sisters, it may be a time of breakthrough, spiritual breakthrough that the devil will come against you. That's why you must be alert. Don't say because I'm praying and fasting, the devil can't come. When did he come to Jesus? Prayer and fasting. All the 30 years that Jesus had lived, we have no account of the devil trying to get Jesus. But when he's starting his ministry, when something great is about to come, he comes to, to try and defeat the, uh, the Lord Jesus and frustrate the plan of God. Remember we said he tries to stop what God is doing. When you read Luke chapter 4, uh, from verse 1 onwards, at the beginning, you'll find the three temptations. The first one, it is to do with the body. It is food that he tried to test Jesus with. And I will not go into details of this. The second was the desire for power. So he told Jesus, I will give you the trappings of this world. 
you know, and that is an area where the devil will test us. He will test us on the basic needs, the food and uh, the, the clothes and just those basic things, the houses. But that's level one. Secondly, he will come with the trappings of power. It's like the hierarchy of needs. When the basics have been sorted out, the next one, when you want to be somebody. Then the, the third one was the issue of spiritual fanatism or spiritual arrogance. Because he told Jesus, you are the son of God, just show off. Just drop yourself and the angels will come and lift you. And that is a temptation that comes especially to us as men of God. When God has started to use you, this is a very likely area. Let me summarize this by saying, the devil's strategy was to target the vulnerable, when we are vulnerable. Two, misappropriation of scriptures. You know, he would come with half-truth. Jesus overcame him by saying, it is written. And the devil realized how powerful it is to use the word of God. So he came to Jesus and started saying, it is written. But Jesus knew the scriptures thoroughly. So he overcame. A misappropriation of the scriptures. He comes in times of isolation. He uses seemingly innocent natural instincts, for example, appetites, food, and power to try and get us down. But Jesus overcame him by using the word of God. I will not expound because you know he said it is written. Secondly, by being led in the spirit. That chapter starts, the spirit of the Lord is the one that led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted. And it closes by saying, and Jesus came out of the wilderness led by the spirit. If you are going to overcome, make sure you are led by the spirit of God on a continuous basis. It even says you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Thirdly, he was serving God in righteousness. Only moral and spiritual means will lead to moral and spiritual ends. You must walk in righteousness. And fourthly, we find that he was, he was not loving the world. And this is a big thing. John, 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, it tells us, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And you could read to the end. I want to say, if you do not have eternity in perspective, I repeat, if you do not have eternity in perspective, you will most likely be defeated by the devil. If you are thinking only in the present, in the here and now, your focus is only what you will get here and now, you will be defeated. We must remember that we are here for a season. It is by living a sacrificial life. Jesus finally defeated the devil by going to the cross and dying for you and for me sacrificial life sacrificial life that was the ultimate he defeated the devil so that we can enjoy victory and he bought our victory brothers and sisters i want to close by telling you that the weapons of our warfare come from that fact of sacrificial life of jesus we are told in first john and i'll read a number of scriptures here first john 3 8 the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. It is clear. The last Adam was here to reverse the misdeeds of the first Adam. The first Adam fell in the Garden of Eden. The last Adam destroyed the works of the devil in the wilderness. And we therefore are here to decree and declare the victory that God has given Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, which is the theme verse of this season. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The devils have been defeated. They are like a tree that has been uprooted. It may show like the, the leaves are still green, but as long as it is not on the soil, it is dead. It is like a snake that has been hit on the head. It is dead. 
but the body may still wiggle and it may appear to be alive, but he is defeated. And we are here in spiritual warfare just proclaiming what Jesus has done for us. In the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, it seems everything here is 2 2nd, 2nd. 2nd Corinthians 10 verse 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, Casting down imaginations, not casting the devil, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Notice imaginations of the mind, they are cast to the obedience of Christ, the issue of obedience. Watch your mind. Make sure that you are living in the presence of God. I am coming to the end. The mind is the place of imaginations and thought. It's the battlefront. This underlines the importance of the teaching of the word of God. Right now, as I'm teaching you the word of God, this is spiritual warfare. By you getting the truth, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from what? From the lies of the devil. Because if the devil can teach you one lie and you buy it, he can take a holiday in Hawaii and leave you to walk with that lie. So when we teach the word of God, when your senior pastor or any of the pastors stand here and they are teaching the truth and you understand it, that already is spiritual warfare. Yes, there is spiritual warfare when we are in prayer. There is spiritual warfare when we are fasting. But the spiritual warfare that happens even more frequently is the truth of God being expounded. Let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. Which mind? The mind of obedience. The mind of humility. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 to 11. It talks about us humbling ourselves and walking in godliness. Make sure that you guard every gateway to avoid possession or even oppression from the devil. Demons in friends may manifest themselves in the antagonism of how, you know, the word of God is being preached or even try to separate us from one another. Christian disunity and corrupt uh, conduct may be part of what the devil is fighting us with. Uh, loving of pleasure is another thing that he will use and more than anything else, he loves defeating us by just living in ritualistic formalism. So that we are just doing things without understanding. And he says, ah, how on wangu? He takes a holiday because they will continue in ritual formalism. Doing things that, you know, having a form of godliness as it is written in 2 Timothy 3.5. But denying the power thereof. I close. I am coming to the end. I am past time. With a story. Two donkeys were overheard speaking somewhere in Jerusalem. The first one said, I don't understand it. Just yesterday, see, it's not long time ago, just yesterday, everyone was throwing their clothes and palms on the, on the road as I was walking with Jesus on my back. But now, I am, ba I am back to being a nothing. The people don't even recognize me. They don't even salute me. The second donkey answered, It works like that, my friend. Without Jesus, you are nothing in this world. This is true of spiritual warfare. Without Jesus, you are, you are just wasting your time. There is no spiritual victory. But with Jesus, then you are an overcomer. <laughs>